Good morning, everyone. My name is Mandy. I'm the director here at Historic Johnson Farm, and I wanted to take you all on a virtual tour today. Uh, while I know many of you are at home looking for things to do, so I am going to share my screen. Get these pictures pulled up. I thought about just taking my phone and walking through the house, but I thought that that might um, be a little shaky and it might make you dizzy. So I just have pictures of the different rooms of the house and of some other buildings here. So this is the Johnson farmhouse. A man named Oliver Moss uh, bought 500 acres of land here in the early 1870s and he hired a man named Riley Barnett to build the house that you see here. The house took a number of years to be completed. Uh, the bricks were made here on site and they got mud from the nearby French Broad River and they put the bricks in the kilns and something happened and the bricks came out misshapen. So they kind of cobbled them together the best they could. Then they covered the walls with a layer of lime and brick dust uh, called parge. And then the builder hand painted all of the lines that you see. So that's one reason why it took a number of years for the house to be completed. Uh, the style of the house, the architectural style, is called vernacular Italianate. Vernacular just means there were no set plans uh, that the builder used to build it. And we see the Italianate style in these columns here with this scroll work, the bay window, uh, as well as a few other things. Now, Oliver Moss was a tobacco farmer. So when he and his family moved into this house, they were growing tobacco on the farm. And just eight years after the house was completed in 1888, the tobacco market uh, started declining in Western North Carolina. So Oliver Moss actually sold this house and a little over 300 acres to Robert and Mary Leverett and their five children who were all teenagers or young adults at this time, but they moved in. They were just running a farm, not tobacco, but they had corn, they had vegetables, they had livestock. And one of their daughters, Sally Leverett, married a man named Leander Johnson, who lived here in Henderson County, uh, but she moved to be with him. And they had two sons, Vernon and Leander. And when both of those, uh, when their sons were still very young, their father passed away. So Sally ended up bringing her two sons back here to her parents' house, which is why we call it the Johnson uh, Farm, because Sally, Vernon, and Leander Johnson were the last people to live here, and they were also the longest, uh, or the people that lived here the longest. So that's who we're mostly going to be talking about is Sally and her two sons, Vernon and Leander. So they moved back in with Sally's parents and they helped them run the farm. And by 1914, uh, both of Sally's parents had passed away. So Sally was trying to figure out a way that she as a single mother could try to make ends meet and uh, bring in some more money rather than just farming. Uh, so she actually opened up this house for summer guests to come and stay and spend uh, either a few weeks, a couple months, or the whole summer here. Uh, most of these people came up from Florida to get away from the heat and the humidity and escape the mosquitoes, and they wanted to come up here to the cool mountain air. Uh, so when they came up here, this is the view they saw when they walked into the house for the first time. Uh, and actually, they probably walked in from this back door because the driveway actually went to the back of the house. Uh, but they would come into this little foyer area. And if you notice on the staircase here, this is an original banister with all this original uh, uh, woodwork here. That would have taken a while for uh, Riley Barnett to build all of that before power tools. So this became a type of boarding house. Guests would first pay uh, $5 a week to stay here. That included the room and three meals a day cooked by Sally. And in a minute, we'll see where Sally did all of that cooking. That price did increase a little bit throughout the years. I've tracked it down to the late 1920s. It was about $12 or $13 a person, um, which seems really cheap to us, but we do have to remember that back then that would have been worth more. Uh, we've had a lot of inflation since then, but still it was a pretty good deal because it included three meals a day. 
Now downstairs, if we're walking, this first doorway on your left that you see is this room, and this is Betty's room. Now Betty was Sally's sister, so Betty Leverett was one of Robert and Mary's five children. Uh, Betty never married, and so she stayed here in her parents' house, and Betty was physically disabled we think possibly due to a polio illness. So that is why her bedroom is here on the first floor. She could not climb the stairs very well. So her bedroom was here uh, in this room, the bed, the trunk, the sewing machine, the thread cabinet here, they are all original to the farm. So in a number of the rooms, we do have a lot of original pieces. And, uh, Sally actually passed away, or sorry, Betty passed away pretty soon after her parents did in 1918, uh, and Sally never rented this room out to summer guests. This was her sister's room, and she used it as storage, but she wouldn't let any uh, guests stay here. Now, moving on to the next room, the parlor. Uh, when guests came to stay during the summer, this room was adults only. Adults could sit in here, talk, play card games, uh, but a lot of times if the weather was nice, the adults were sitting on the back porch, rocking in the rocking chair, swinging on the porch swing. Uh, and kids that came up, they would be outside all day, every day. Uh, there was a creek that they would swim in. Vernon especially would take them around on the wagon and teach them how to take care of the animals, teach them how to milk a cow. A lot of these people were from cities, so they, some of them had never even probably seen a cow. Uh, much less stayed at a farm. Now in this room, uh, it's kind of hard to see, but Vernon, the older son, he loved to make furniture. So he made this uh, table that's in the window here, and we'll see a few of those, I think, throughout, um, because this was kind of his go-to table he made. He made this book stand and drawers over here. And the light was actually a wedding gift to Sally and Leander Sr. in 1890 when they got married. Uh, and it was originally kerosene powered, so the kerosene would sit in this little bowl here. The Johnsons did not get electricity in this house until the early 1920s, and that's kind of a fun story. There was a prison about a half a mile away. Uh, they were moving the prison about a half mile away, and they needed electricity for the prison, and Vernon Johnson knew all about engineering, so he was able to string the wires and the poles himself and connect the prison to the city's electricity. And then he asked if he could continue the wires to the house, and that uh, is why the Johnson farmhouse became the first house in this immediate area to have electricity. Now across the hall from these two rooms is the Seton room. Now during the summer when guests were here, they would set up tables in here to have kind of an overflow dining space. Uh, Sally also sometimes kept her bed in here, especially during the winter because uh, they put a coal furnace in the cellar and this room was the warmest room in the house. Now we see cutouts of Vernon on the left and Leander on the right. They always wore khaki pants, a tan shirt, a little white sailor's hat, uh, pretty much that's their uniform, a sweater if it was cold, but in the majority of pictures we have of them, that is what they're wearing. Now in this room, we see a miniature version of that table from the parlor that Vernon made. So he made this table. He also made this desk to the right, and that uh, desk belonged to Leander. They were the second family in Henderson County to purchase a radio for their house. And we see the bottom of the radio here and the speaker up here. In 1926, when they bought this radio, it cost them $300, which was a lot of money back then. It would be a lot of money now for a radio, but they treasured this thing greatly. They would listen to all the programs, the president's speeches, um, ball games on the radio, so they really enjoyed it. Now, attached to the set room is the dining room. The table here was made uh, by Sally's father, Robert, with wood from the farm. And you can't tell from these pictures, but the interesting thing about the table is there are no center table legs. It's just two on each end. So there's no legs in the middle. So you could fit four or five, even more chairs on each side. We call it a boarding house table. 
So if you're looking here, this is the doorway to the setting room. This is the doorway to the hallway, the front hallway that we saw. This is the doorway, same over here, to the back porch. And you can kind of see this little opening here. That was not originally there. So originally, the kitchen was in a separate building, as was fairly common back then. Uh, the risk of fire, the extreme heat from your cooking, you don't want that in a non-air conditioned house. So the kitchen was in a separate building. The Johnson brothers decided once they got electricity that that was kind of silly. So at some point, and we're not entirely sure of the year, but they cut some big trees down, put logs underneath the kitchen building, got their big horses to pull the kitchen towards the house, and then they cut through the 18 inches of brick here on the back of the house and just attach the kitchen. So this is current. This is what it looks like currently. Well, minus the snow. Uh, we don't, I have not found any pictures of the kitchen as a separate building, but we do know that was the case. So this is what the kitchen looks like on the inside. There we go. Uh, so this is a cutout of Sally Johnson. All the summer guests that came called her Aunt Sally. She was five feet tall. She usually wore her hair in a bun. She always wore an apron. And this cutout is standing beside the wood stove that she did all of her cooking on. Even when she got this electric stove over here to the right, she would only boil water on it because this is what she was used to. This is what she knew. Uh, and usually she would have a big pile of wood right around here where the cursor is. And she would put the wood in here, light a match, and that would, uh, I'm sure she kept the stove on all day during the summer because she was doing cooking for so many people. And this is where she did all of the cooking. Let me exit out of this box. There we go. Now to go upstairs in the house, the first room you would come to is this small room that was not a bathroom at first when Oliver Moss lived here or when Sally's parents lived here or even when the Johnson brothers were young, this bathroom was not here. This bathroom was put in in the 1920s about the same time they had electricity or they got electricity. We, our best guess is that this was a small room uh, beforehand, small bedroom. Uh, but then it became a bathroom. The first bedroom uh, upstairs is this room. We have some of the Johnson Brothers items in here, like the typewriter and Leander's war uniform. So both brothers went to college during the 19 teens. They went to A&M College, Agriculture and Mechanical College, which is now NC State University in Raleigh. Vernon studied mechanical engineering, which is how he knew how to do the electricity and then Leander studied uh, chemistry. Now after graduation or after they were in school Vernon came back home. Uh, Leander briefly joined the army and that is his uniform we see there. This was during World War I but since Leander had studied chemistry he was able to secure a spot in the chemical warfare department uh, and he was able to stay in America and not have to go overseas and fight. Uh, but that lasted just under a year and then he came back to the Johnson farm and other than that brief time in the 19 teens they stayed here the rest of their lives they neither one of them married or had children the story is that their mom did not approve of the girls they brought home and uh, the the girls she liked for them they did not like so for whatever reason they never married now the next room is what we call the honeymoon suite. A couple from Miami, Florida, Frank and Judy Walker actually spent part of their honeymoon here uh, at the farm in this room. And when they had their family, they had three kids, they would bring them up every summer. So this was always the room they would stay in. Now the wedding dress uh, is not directly related to the farm, but it does date back to 1891. So one year after Sally got married, so her dress might have looked something like this. Now there is an attic. Uh, we don't have pictures of that. That's just used for storage, but there are three rooms up there that Sally would rent uh, and people would actually pay to stay there. But across the hall on the second floor are the three other bedrooms. So there's a total of five bedrooms on the second floor. 
here is one of those. Now this bed dates back to the antebellum period before the Civil War. The next room is a little bit misleading. We have a lot of toys in here, but kids did not have their own room. This wasn't the kids' room. Families would stay in rooms together, but we kind of just wanted to um, keep everything together here. Now in this room, Vernon made this cradle, he made the barn, and he made the donkeys and the carts on the bed. And then the last bedroom upstairs is this room, and this was always rented out to a doctor from Jacksonville, Florida, uh, a man named Dr. Otto Toninson. He was a podiatrist, and when he, well, he would spend his summers here, but then when he retired, he spent about half his year up here. This was always his room. And this room is the only bedroom that has uh, windows facing each other, so you could let a little breeze through. So those uh, eight bedrooms total, five on the second floor, three in the attic, those could be full during the summer, and they usually were. And so the Johnsons had to start thinking of ways that they could expand their boarding house business. So in 1923, the Johnson brothers themselves built this boarding house. Uh, it had 11 bedrooms and two bathrooms on the inside. Guests would still go next door to the farmhouse to eat uh, their meals, but this front porch here was used for socializing. They would have dances on it. They would play music. They would make homemade ice cream. And uh, once Sally died, which we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, it was pretty much sitting abandoned for over 50 years. And about 10 years ago, the heritage weavers and fiber artists, uh, they approached the farm and wondered about utilizing this space. And so that is who is presently using this building. And it's a really good partnership we have with them. But this is what some of the inside looks like. So they are a group of people that do anything fiber related. Uh, weaving, obviously in this room on the looms, spinning, uh, knitting, crocheting, punch needle, rug hooking. Some of them dye their own wool. Uh, they spin, they um, just amazing things going on here. Now this room that the looms are in would have been two bedrooms. You can kind of see here at the bottom where there would have been a wall. And they also offer classes. So if you're local and you're interested in learning any of these things, they offer classes. Now, currently they are closed uh, as are a lot of places, but when things pick back up, they would love to have visitors. They also have a gift shop with all handmade items from members there. Now this is another building on the farm. The left part of the building is a smokehouse. So that's where the Johnsons would hang their meat and to dry. Uh, and they later kept their ice box in there and their refrigerator. So to give you some perspective, the kitchen is to the left of this. So it's very close. Uh, so the, uh, the whole house is to the left, but the kitchen is right here. You can see part of the gutter. Now, you might be wondering if Sally had anyone helping her during the summer when they could have 40 or more people staying here. She would try to find local young ladies to help out. For whatever reason, most of them did not last long. They probably weren't used to the hard work that was necessary to run the farm and the boarding house. But she did finally find a local young lady, Etta Presley. Uh, and it was easier for Etta to stay here during the summer at least. So Vernon and Leander built this right hand part of this building for Etta to stay in. And this is what it looks like on the inside. She even had a TV there in the 50s, but she had a little living space. Now on the right hand wall, we have put a bunch of the tools and farming implements that the Johnson brothers collected through the years. But Etta would not have had this on her wall when she was living there. But she also had a bedroom and a bathroom, her own bathroom. And the farm's laundry was also in this building because Etta did all of the laundry uh, for the bedding, the blankets, the sheets. Uh, and sometimes guests would pay her an additional amount to do their clothing laundry while they were staying here. Oops, there. Okay, now another building we have on here at the farm is this little cottage. 
Now, Vernon and Leander were usually kicked out of their bedrooms during the summer so that people could rent their rooms out. So in 1933, Vernon got tired of that and he built himself this little cottage. Uh, and it's kind of like a little tiny house. So on the inside, it's really just one room. Uh, he had his bed, uh, some chairs, and a, a bathroom. He did have a bathroom upstairs. And then downstairs was his little wood shop where he made all that furniture. And it also had a shower downstairs. So some of the male boarders would come and shower there. Uh, the books you see are all books that uh, were here at the farm. So many of them were the Johnsons. We have a lot of their college books, college notebooks, even some of the tests they took and the, um, the notes they took in college. Now, in 1958, Sally passed away and her two sons decided they really couldn't or didn't want to keep up the boarding house business. So they officially closed. They so, still had some of their regulars coming here and there for a week or two, but they were not feeding them. It was a lot quieter here. And about the same time, just up the road, a new high school was being built called West Henderson High School. And the Johnson brothers started walking over there and ended up doing the landscaping for the school and helping build the football stadium, which is still called Johnson Field after them. And they became really good friends with the principal, a man named Glenn Marlowe. Glenn Marlowe would later become superintendent of Henderson County Public Schools for over tw or for about 20 years. And that friendship with him uh, and just the closeness that the brothers had with the high school teachers and students once it opened uh, led them to donate about 40 acres across the street, which was Johnson Farmland. They donated that to the school system in the 1970s to build the middle school that's over there now. Rugby Junior High was what it was called. Now it's Rugby Middle. Uh, the name Rugby comes from the one-room schoolhouse that Vernon and Leander actually attended when they were young children. So they donated 40 acres across the street. They gave some land away to family and friends to build houses on. And then when Vernon passed away in 1978, they both agreed that since they did not have anyone to any descendants to leave the farm to, that they were going to leave uh, the land to Henderson County Public Schools. So they donated the land and 10 historic buildings to the public school system, which is a pretty unique situation. Uh, Leander did not pass away until 1987. And in the early 90s, a nonprofit was formed to help take care of the farm. Uh, and to this day, the school system still owns the land and the buildings. Uh, but the nonprofit Historic Johnson Farm Foundation uh, kind of manages the day-to-day -day operations here. Uh, so that uh, relationship with the school system still continues. Vernon and Leander would love it. Their goal was for children to come and experience uh, how they grew up, how the Johnsons themselves grew up, and think about uh, how things have changed over the years. And uh, hopefully sooner rather than later, we'll get back to that. Uh, we were able to have two field trips this spring, and we hope, uh, we really hope that we're able to have kids back here and, and adults, uh, the general public, to do these tours in person soon. A couple more slides to show you. This is actually the oldest building here at the farm. It was originally the granary where they kept the crops. Uh, Riley Barnett, the builder of the brick farmhouse, he actually lived in this building while he was building the house. But for about 10 years now, we have recreated it as a one-room schoolhouse, uh, as you see on the right there. So when kids come on field trips, we do a little lesson with them, telling them what, uh, what it would have been like in a one-room schoolhouse. And then the last building I want to show you is the barn. Oops. Uh, the barn was built by Vernon and Leander. It kept their cows and their horses. Uh, they had a separate barn for their pigs and a separate uh, space for their chickens. Uh, the animals lived downstairs and upstairs the Johnsons kind of created their own little museum which we still have a lot of their stuff in here. Uh, on, along the walls we have all their tools, um, just fur animals. Lester and April and then Riley and Oliver. 
So thank you all for watching. If you have any questions, please message us on Facebook or email us. Thanks.